Good morning, everybody. This is Hafid al -Ghwil. I am a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute uh, at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, or SAIS for short. Uh, I want to welcome you all, especially those who are joining us from all parts of the world. Um, we have uh, such a distinguished panel of senior U.S. diplomats and officials, former, I should say, who are uh, going to join us today to discuss or share with us their insights uh, on U.S. policy or U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, with some emphasis on the role of gender in this policy. Um, I hope you all are ready to uh, listen to a great set of uh, ideas and thoughts and experiences from uh, truly a very senior level uh, former U.S. officials. Uh, I'm going to hand over uh, uh, the mic in a minute to my uh, colleague Chido, uh, who will be moderating this event. But before I do that, let me just remind you that your questions are always welcome and you can use the function at the uh, bottom of your screen, uh, which is marked as Q&A, to submit your questions. There will be also a number of polling questions appearing on your screen throughout the program to get your reaction and participation. We expect a large audience. We have now over 200 people already on, and I see the ticker increasing every second, so we're probably gonna get many more soon. So Chido, let me hand over the, the floor to you, and uh, let's start. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Hafid. Uh, my name is, uh... Uh, Dr. Chido Wanko, I teach with the African Studies Program here at SAIS, and I also direct the SAIS Women Lead. Um, good morning for those of you joining us from uh, the East Coast here in the United States, and I hope your day is going well or your day has gone well if you're joining us from other regions of the world. Um, we are truly happy that you're joining us today to discuss this interesting and um, very important topic of U.S. diplomacy and women's leadership in the MENA region, uh, particularly given the times we're in. And um, as Hafid has said, uh, you can please uh, send your comments and your questions to the Q&A. We will have so many questions that we will most likely be unable to get to every one of them. So to help us get to as many as we can, please um, send your questions. Be um, short and as straightforward as possible. And uh, also, uh, we will be sending you the uh, poll questions and uh, just click on the response that you wish to um, ask your response and then just click enter and then we'll get your responses. And so as Hafid has said, we have a group of esteemed and seasoned diplomats with us today. Um, remarkable women who have left huge footprints um, on the field of U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy, particularly in the MENA region. Um, and so joining us today uh, is Ambassador Ann Patterson, former Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East and U.S. Ambassador to Egypt and Pakistan. Also with us is Ambassador Deborah Jones, former U.S. Ambassador to Libya and Kuwait. We have Ambassador Gina Abakombi Winstanley, former U.S. Ambassador to Malta. Ambassador Robin Raphael, former Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia, and U.S. Ambassador to Tunisia. We also have with us Kristen Foden Rose, Director of the Skullcrafts Center at the Atlantic Council and former director of the Gulf region at the National Security Council. Um, and so as Dr. Hafid already said, just to start us off and demonstrate how the poll will work, uh, we are sending you the, out the first poll. Please um, feel free to respond to any of the choices uh, that most closely approximates how you identify and then um, we will go on. Uh, 
And so um, as you do this, I think we should just jump right in because we do not have much time um, without wasting further time. I think uh, we will just go right to the first question. To folks um, who have not invested decades as you know, some of us here have uh, uh, in, as professionals either in the study scholarship of US foreign policy to the region or as practitioners in one way or the other, um, American foreign policy to the MENA region, that's the Middle East and the Northern region, can often seem eclectic. It can often seem haphazard. And at times, right, it might resemble somewhat of a tangled um, mess of interests and, um, you know, power play, right, for the most part. And uh, of this then, gives rise to the confusion that we have uh, kind of experienced, right, uh, across the region in terms of how people perceive American foreign policy. Some see it as, you know, this bemused um, standoffishness. Others see, read it as isolationism, at times bellicose isolationism. Um, at times, it's swinging, you know, uh, like a pendulum from uh, real politic shaped um, stability to democratic uh, democracy pro promotion to imperatives of counterterrorism, right? And so, based on all this, it's a lot going on. And so, people argue that U.S. foreign policy to the region, as a result of this confusion does exacerbate, you know, conflict on the region, right? If it's not exacerbating conflict, it's generating new ones as a result of the proxy rivalries it generates <laughs> across the region. Um, and so there is this whole confusion. What indeed is America's foreign policy to the MENA region? Um, uh, people who argue that you know, if we look at Afghanistan 2001, Iraq 2003, Libya 2011, um, the Saudi deputized uh, conflict in Yemen, a lot going on. And so that America is in fact a huge part of the problem uh, in the region. Are people who make this argument right? Uh, is this a fair assessment or are they off the mark? Um, I think perhaps let's start with Ambassador Patterson and then we'll go around the panel. Well, uh, please unmute yourself. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hoffett and, uh, and Dr. Chido. Uh, that's a complex question and, and I was gonna start off, uh, let me say that fundamentally, I think the United States has been historically, it's as a global superpower, always has a variety of objectives and interests in any region of the world and is a force for good. But I thought I would outline uh, very briefly what I see as the main challenges uh, for the U.S. and the region uh, over the next few years. Um, and the first on this list, I think, would be uncertainty for me about Saudi Arabia, which has for decades has been a strategic American ally. Oil prices have recovered uh, again this morning, but they're still low by the standards that the Saudis require to balance their budget. And the Saudis have been running through financial reserves at a rapid clip and more importantly, cutting back on subsidies. Lower oil prices will force guest workers to go home to poor countries like Pakistan and Egypt and donations from Gulf countries will decline. We don't know much about the domestic situation in Saudi Arabia, particularly about the clerics or about the religious establishment, much less about the intentions of the crown prince. So we have very limited insights in my view about how the Saudis will respond to COVID-19 and lower oil prices. We also don't know much about the domestic situation in Iran, which has been badly hit by coronavirus. The leadership has clearly shown it can survive crippling, crippling sanctions in my view, the Iranians are likely biding their time before challenging the U.S., whether in the Gulf, in Lebanon, in Iraq, uh, or elsewhere in cyber. Uh, still, I thought the exchange of prisoners last, last week between the U.S. and Iran was a good step. 
Uh, and I wouldn't rule out an October surprise with Iran uh, before our presidential election. And then the third is a resurgence of terrorism, uh, the concentration of, of ISIS combatants and their dependents in these horrible conditions in a hole in other camps is an incubator for terrorism for decades to come. It's also an incubator for disease and humanitarian groups have been raising the alarm about this, but no one really knows since testing is, uh, is limited. And then finally, I wanna talk about presidential transitions. Um, they, uh, should there be one? This is always a period of confusion in the US government and other countries know the US is distracted. Regional leaders keep hearing that the US is going to withdraw from the region and focus on Asia, but most of them really don't know what this means for them. Uh, so I would watch carefully what could happen in the region during a US presidential transition. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador Patterson. Ambassador Jones, do you want to um, join sure. us here? Yeah, I'll try to be a little bit shorter. I think that one thing that we have learned, and I think that uh, those who observe us should have learned in the process as well, is that the U.S. is very good when it comes to supporting um, established allies who have clear uh, external threats to them, such as in the case of Kuwait and the invasion by Iraq. Um, and even following uh, World War II, we were very good at, at going into societies such as Germany and Japan that were highly organized, had a lot of resources in terms of human resources and civil society, and were able to help them rebuild and help rebuild the rest of Europe. We have been far less successful in going into places and trying to transform them or trying to uh, in, essentially flip on its head the way that things have, have customarily been done in the name of promoting um, democracy. And so I think that what you see right now uh, is that, um, especially when there are no clear US interests involved, I think we have an administration in this, in this particular case uh, that has decided that um, we were not very successful at these projects, therefore let regional powers such as Russia, whether it's Russia, UAE, Turkey, et cetera, who might have more uh, focused interests, let them uh, get involved with it. And we kind of watch from the outside. I'm not saying that's a good policy, but I'm saying that that appears to be what the approach is right now. And I think that we always find this uh, this kind of schizophrenia on the part of our friends, parts of our friends and neighbors in the regions that they want the US to be involved as long as they could calibrate it, but, they're not, but then they want to be able to blame, I mean, when things go wrong. And the fact is the US does not have a magic wand. And I think that that's been made very clear uh, more recently in the way that, that you know, in the, in the challenges that we're facing now, we're, we do our best. I think as, as Ambassador Patterson said, we've done a lot of good. Uh, I think, as uh, Ambassador Patterson has alluded to, you know, things there are consequences of things that we have not always taken into account, and and we also have a different factor in our foreign policy making. Um, unlike, for example, the French or others, we there's a very um, or has been in the past a very uh, important domestic component of that through the Congress. A lot of interests that have to be reflected from a very large democracy, over 340 million people now, or 335 million people, um, that's, a, that's a busy mix and it always ends up with solutions or actions that are either so incremental that people are frustrated or so dramatic when they're not, uh, uh, when they don't come through that very rigorous process, we have a policy making um, such as the invasion of Iraq, that they end up being very disruptive. So um, I think that um, we'll see what happens. I think if we do have a change of administration, I think we'll probably go back to something that more people are familiar with. But in fact, there have been criticisms of us throughout in how we've dealt with all sorts of uh, issues. And the point is, you know, we, we don't either always create, sometimes we've created, but we generally, our role has been to try to manage a situation so that it um, addresses our interests as well as the interests of others. And, you know, that's not easy. And it's not a science, it's an art. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm, I am test, uh, tempted to follow up on a couple of things you said. Uh, one, you said that, you know, the US uh, seems to be pulling back and letting regional powers uh, handle the issues within the region like Russia, right? Russia is not um, a regional power, so to speak, in 
uh, North Africa, right? Um, so, uh, you know, let's leave that. Um, and then you also said that, you know, the, uh, the U.S. part of the problem is that um, when the U.S. is in pursuit of its own interests, given the multiplicity of actors within the domestic arena, right, who's, you know, then, you know, the corporatization of an aggregation of these interests gives rise to a kind of engagement that becomes problematic. Is it then the issue, then can we then say that U.S.'s interests, right, uh, ends up being, um, you know, generating uh, problems, right, uh, for the entities, right, that it seeks to, in fact, um, help? Um, I think perhaps let's move on to uh, Ambassador Winston Lee and then Ambassador uh, Raphael. Please okay. unmute. Well, thank you. Yes, I did unmute. Thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction to a question. Uh, in short, does the United States cause problems as well as bring solutions? And I think the record shows that we certainly can. Anytime that we are putting our interests before the interests of the people in the region, there is going to be a conflict. So as Ambassador Patterson and Ambassador Jones said, it, it's not a science, it's an art. Um, give me the second half of your question again, remind me. Um, and so, okay, perhaps let me just add to that. Okay. So if we then look at what is happening, um, you know, the, the, in the current administration, uh, what is happening in Libya, right, uh, as Ambassador uh, Jones had just, uh, you know, articulated uh, the tendency for U.S. currently to seem to retract, right, to pull back. Uh, it would then see, seem as though, you know, all these other um, actors, right, uh, the Qataris, the Emiratis, uh, the Saudis, and then Russia and all these other uh, spoilers, as you know, people in the field who want to call them, are really exploit exploiting the situation. Um, recently, you know, there's kind of been a change in power shift within Libya, um, shaped by the Turkey Turkey's uh, increasing um, support of the GNA uh, government in Tripoli. Has the U.S. Right, less, you know, bearing in mind that we cannot move away from, you know, pointing a finger at U.S. Uh, regarding the start of that conflict, right? Has the U.S. lost uh, moral grounds uh, as well as political leverage, right, in um, Libya as well as in the region with regards to the Libyan uh, conflict? Or is this just a break, right? before Libya again, um, you know, gets back on the path to becoming another Syria in the region. Mm. I, I'm gonna turn it over to Ambassador Jones for the Libya specific, but you have mentioned a number of countries that are involved in Libya, and of course there are more, if you include the Europeans, etc. cetera. Um, the United States does not control Libya. I think you'd get a lot of pushback from all of us about us starting the conflict within Libya. But on the balance between Turkey and the Emiratis, I mean, all of them have a role to play. And, and Ambassador Jones, I'll let you add to it since I know that you are focusing on that area. Ambassador Jones, please. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, boy, that's a long uh, question there. But let me just say a couple of things. One, there, all of the players at some point do have interests of their own. Um, you say that Russia is not that Russia has been in Libya with Gaddafi for a long time and had its aims on that. Libya is a very valuable piece of real estate. I'm not justifying the U.S. policy. I'm describing, I, and I think you'll see that we have stepped in now more and been more assert assertive now that Russia has been more assertive in the policy. Turkey has historic ties in Libya, not only uh, flesh and blood ties, they have Ottoman ties, they have commercial ties, and they have family ties in Misrata that go back hundreds of years. So it's not surprising that Turkey would go in very openly, I might add, by the way, very transparently with the support of its parliament and everything else to support the UN recognized government as opposed to other players in the region who I would say 
um, whose approach has been le more surreptitious, let us say, perhaps less transparent, but I think has to be looked at in the same way that the U.S. approached communism uh, in the 1950s and 60s. For them, this is, the, the political Islam is an existential threat for them, for their way of life, for their way of governance. And they, uh, you know, I always think back on our domino theory and how many parts of it were kind of misguided. But on the other hand, how many people uh, tr fully believed in that? And I think that in order to understand the context of both sides, and again, by way of explanation, not by justification, uh, that that is the approach that you see coming out of the UAE, because then in that instance, uh, Cairo, Egypt becomes an important buttress uh, for stopping the spread of that uh, political Islam, however one wishes to define it. You know, the, to slap the tag of Muslim Brotherhood, or which I think is a false binary, by the way. I, I personally feel it's an extremely false binary to say that Libya is about uh, democratic secularists versus, you know, uh, political Islamists. I think it's about um, some people who were quite content with the status quo ante, but would prefer to do a Gaddafi light uh, rather than do a, a full-blown democracy that's messy and that allows for a country as potentially wealthy as Libya to have access to all those resources to spread its for a form of modern communism, you know, which is political Islam. But I think in that thing, let us not forget, Arab League asked the US and NATO to step in in the beginning. That, you know, I think people are very forgetful of that, that, that we did not initiate that. Barack Obama was always very uh, reluctant to get involved. The French were much more gung-ho uh, because they have counterterrorism interests. So they don't want, uh, Libya is very close to Europe. They don't want that kind of, of upheaval uh, going on in, in southern Libya and these ungoverned areas. So my point is, these things are really, really complicated. I think that having come out of, first having seen Rwanda, we didn't want to leave a slaughter in Libya. That no one could have lived with that. The Arab countries could not have, and the African Union fr frankly could not have either, lived with seeing uh, standing by while uh, protesters were, were uh, slaughtered as Gaddafi threatened to do. Now we can all go back and rehash and say, was he serious, was he not? But that's not the point. In the political moment of the time, that was an issue. Um, secondly, <laughs> Uh, I don't think that you could have had, um, once Gaddafi was killed, that was not uh, intended, that was not part of the plan. Uh, it was an unfinished revolution. Everybody saw that. The U.S. following the experience of, of Iraq thought the last thing we need to do and can do is get immersed in another situation where they don't want us there on the ground and made very clear that they didn't. Um, so, you know, sum up in a short note, Space abhors a vacuum. Other people with interest in that very pricey real estate start poking their heads in. I will criticize the U.S. on one point, which is that the, the lack of a unified policy that was agreed to across our administration um, made us less effective in supporting the UN process, which was a slow and is a slow and painful process. We have an impatience in the West for solutions. And that is leads to more problems sometimes. And I'll leave there. Sorry, I've said more than I probably should have. Okay. Um, uh, fair, fair points uh, you raised. You can see I don't feel strongly about this at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. You certainly don't. <laughs> um, Kirsten, I'll be curious to, you know, uh, hear what you have to say on this. And then just to add on that. Uh, because, of course, you've been part of this administration, we're wondering if you have um, any insights, right, on what you think this um, a schizophrenic uh, character of U.S. Uh, engagement of and, and Iran, uh, what it portends for the region, right? You have uh, proactive bellicosity, you have passive um, accommodation, right? Uh, giving um, the administration's recent, um, you know, actions, right? The, the exits of the unilateral exit uh, from the Iran deal, um, the Khashoggi, you know, tragedy, the armed deal, um, Saudi in Yemen. <laughs> What impact do you think this character uh, of U.S. foreign policy in this region uh, has for both 
in the short term and in the long term for U.S. involvement. Uh, do you think U.S. has lost moral grounds as well as uh, political credibility in the nature of its, um, you know, uh, actions in the region? I do think we have some ground to make up. Uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of questions out there about whether we'll make a good partner for the long haul or not. But in the same breath, I would argue that the, the countries that say that publicly, that question our commitment publicly, come to us behind the scenes every day begging us to stay engaged. And the U.S. does intend to stay engaged. In many cases, we're questioning the commitment from the region. You know, when we watch them flirt with Russian weapon sales and we watch them purchase UAV platforms from China and talk about building commercial ports that we know will not be commercial, we question whether or not the region is actually committed to us often. Uh, and I think people in the region understand that we have a four-year system and it's not perfect. And it means that where we may know what we're going to be dealing with in their countries for the next 50 years, if there's a monarchical ruler, for instance, or an, a self-appointed autocrat, they don't know what they're dealing with here. But in some cases, that is actually part of our, of our um, projected power. You know, if, if, um, if folks know that we have enduring interest, we want to make sure there is no safe haven for counter terror, you know, for, for terrorism. We want to make sure that global shipping lanes and the flow of energy are secure. We want to make sure that our partners capacity and self-sufficiency are increased and along with that their interoperability with us. Those endure through any administration. We don't see a change in that. And then it's just getting to know who's in power. So in this case, you know the president operates with a cost-benefit analysis on every decision. You know he focuses on economy and you know he's very wary of getting the U.S. involved in conflicts around the world. So really, you know, the, the style is questionable, but the, the, the thrust should not ter be terribly surprising. And it's actually far more easy to predict the actions of the U.S. if you just keep in mind those three pieces of information about the way this administration makes its decisions. In every administration, you have ideologues and we have some, you know, like we would any time. But knowing where they're coming from also helps you operate. If you know that there's going to be a maximum pressure on Iran in this administration, then that helps you deal with, okay, well, what other levers do we have? Or how do we shape that pressure? Or um, how can we use their need for that pressure as a lever to allow us to gain things we're looking for in other corners? I know that's kind of vague, but, but I think you all understand what I'm saying there, that, that knowing what those, what those sort of points of, of ideology are actually can be a benefit sometimes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so let's just quickly put up the second um, audience poll question. And um, there you have it. Please go ahead and take a second to respond to that and uh, we'll just move on. Um, and so, uh, changing gears just a little bit. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed serious threats to the economies of the region, as you know, has, is the case for economies all throughout uh, you know, the world. Uh, but adding to this also is the volatility in uh, oil markets and uh, the disruption in alternative sources of revenue, uh, including tourism for the region, as well as the compounding issues of climate change. What are the prospects of a post-COVID U.S. foreign policy in the region? If we take into consideration uh, the fact that the U.S. seems to be um, accumulating challenges all around, right, uh, both domestically and internationally, um, rising populism, um, you know, the challenge, growing challenge from compet competing powers, Russia, China, uh, and the implications that that has for U.S. power, uh, both, you know, domestically and internationally, um, as well as the increasing sectarian violence in the MENA region. And then we consider the fact that U.S. is, as uh, Ambassador Jones has said, you know, seem to be looking a lot more inward, right, right, rather than um, broadcasting uh, power and influence on the international scene. What are we expecting? What do we envision uh, for, you know, the, a post-COVID U.S. Uh, foreign policy uh, and diplomacy in the region? Um, perhaps we would start from Kirsten. Just really quickly, because I know we want to get to other panelists and I just spoke, but I would say that one thing we're, that people should keep in mind is that because of resource constraints, 
that inward piece won't be a political decision. No matter what the elections do in November, the next administration is going to be focused on things like increasing our military readiness. So that means that the, the funds and resources and manpower for doing things like securing our partners or training our partners will, will be contracted. And, uh, and that's going to be a reality. And we're, we're also going to see focuses on things like our defense supply chains, which we think, we think have been damaged by this, because um, that impacts our readiness. We're going to see things like um, our concern over financing of global oil supplies, because you'll see sovereign wealth funds and other available resources for traditional energy sources contract. And what does that mean for great power competition if China is the only place available with funds to put into traditional energy, for instance? So I think we're, we'll, we'll see quite a bit of, of, of shift, but I think the, the piece will really be, it'll really be strategic. We'll be looking at the impacts, not necessarily within two years, but more like five, 10, 20 years. Um. Thank you. So you did say something that's interesting. You said whoever the next administration is, that they will be increasing uh, military readiness, right? Um, I think some people on the other uh, on the other side might argue that instead of increasing our military readiness, perhaps we expand uh, relationship with allies, right? Uh, that way we don't have to uh, continue on the path of um, you know expanding or spending on military readiness. Um, I don't know if you want to speak on that or you want us to move on? Sure, I, I, let's get other opinions, but just really briefly, I'd say that those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Okay, um, Professor Winstanley, please. Um, I, I think I would, I hope we, we don't end up spending the same amount or more money on military readiness. I think there is a strong point of view out there that it, has not and is not currently serving us well and that we need to be spending more attention on conflict resolution, on making sure that the right people are involved in these decisions to help get us to a different place. And this is a, a discussion that has been going on for the last several years about redefining what our national security is, and that it is not simply being the strongest military in the world, being prepared to go fight anywhere or allowing other people to fight. The fact that we do supply weapons to others, the fact that we are spending money on our military is taking away attention and funding and focus on other ways to improve our national security and the world's national security. And that means bringing in different actors for conflict resolution. I think immediately about Afghanistan, and I really want Ambassador Rafael to, to talk to this a bit more. When you think about the commitment that the United States has already made in our Women, Peace, and Security Act that we have passed, we support with the United Nations to ensure that the right people are around the table, that includes women and other minorities around the table, and yet with regard to Afghanistan, we have not put our focus and our, our money where our mouth was there. The women have not been as involved as they should have been. And that goes for conflicts around the world. So I would argue, and I hope, if there is indeed a transition uh, in November that we do do things a different way. And I think there are people who are working to that end at this time. Um, with regard to COVID, a number of programs and policies and plans around the world are faltering. Um, with regard, and I'm thinking about Saudi Arabia, uh, immediately when they were trying to make a shift from being oil-based to knowledge-based, and with COVID-19, this is very much on pause. There are many things around the world that are just stopped because of all the things that have been mentioned with regard to the financial uh, cost uh, for countries around the world. But again, back to Afghanistan, and if Ambassador Rafael could weigh in on that, I think it would really add to this discussion about what that balance should be. Ambassador, Ambassador Rafael, um, briefly, please. Oh, um, Ambassador I'm Rafael? Get <laughs> okay, I'm on now. I, I wanted to thank Dr. Chato, Dr. Hafid for organizing uh, and SICE for sponsoring this seminar. It really is terrific to be on a panel with my most esteemed colleagues. Um, Afghanistan, it has been clear for a very long time that 
the military intervention has resulted in a stalemate. Um, and I think the Trump administration deserves credit for recognizing that and pushing forward uh, with a plan to get, as uh, Ambassador Wynne Stanley has said, the appropriate people to the table. As everyone knows, uh, the US and the Taliban have an agreement uh, which is comprised of a withdrawal timetable in exchange for commitments by the Taliban to um, not let their territory be used for any attacks against the US or its allies and to sit down with uh, uh, the government and other Afghans, including minorities, women, civil society, and so on, uh, to figure out what the political dispensation is going to be going forward in Afghanistan. Um, there has been a lot of toing and froing over who's on that negotiating team that will sit with the Taliban. It's now fully comprised and it has a number of women, minorities, and so on represented. I think in Afghanistan, it's been fascinating over the last 20 years to see how women have found a voice, um, certainly a voice that's now heard around the world. Others would tell you quite correctly that women have had a voice in family life, in community life over the years, but not at the national level so much. And so that's what we're seeing now. Uh, the US is, is very much behind that. Um, it is going to be, however, a slow process uh, and there's going to be a lot of horse trading and so on and so forth. And as Ambassador Jones said, uh, the US isn't particularly good at being patient, um, but I hope the Afghan people are. And I think the most important thing uh, now for us is as this process gets going, which I hope will be in the coming weeks, not months, uh, that we seriously consider what sort of mission we need to have in Afghanistan going forward. Um, I think there will be much less of a military component, but there needs to be a very robust diplomatic, humanitarian, economic development presence to help the Afghans make up for last time uh, and move their economy and their polity forward. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a lot of questions uh, coming in. And, and, and um, I think let's just also briefly, quickly uh, get through one or two more questions from this end, and then we will take audience uh, questions. So let's talk about representation and inclusivity. Uh, like, as you have just noted, um, Ambassador Rafael, um, women um, seem to be marginalized, right? Uh, women are uh, included or women are uh, uh, heavy actors within the family, the, the, the public sphere, the private sphere, right? Uh, but then there seem to be, there is, in fact, data shows that women are marginalized in power productive spaces. For example, uh, in foreign policy and diplomacy in the United States, um, it's very clear that women are marginalized. Only 9%, right? 414 out of the 4,600 um, you know, uh, ambassadors, foreign ambassadors so far in the United States have been women. Um, and this has been shaped by these narratives, you know, that men make better leaders, right? Uh, which has then resulted in this implicit bias as well as institutional barriers that have kept women out. But it does seem as though the narrative is shifting, right? Since the COVID-19, uh, um, there's been a lot of reports, it's CNN, Washington Post, um, the International Atlantic, a lot of these, um, you know, respected media uh, institutions seem to be arguing that women, in fact, make better leaders. Um, so, Ambassador Rafael, do women make better leaders? Are women better diplomats? Um, if uh, they are, what, uh, why do you think that is? And what needs to happen, right, for women to have equal access and opportunity to uh, the foreign policy and diplomacy arena in the US? Uh, maybe, you know, if you can just get through all of us. Okay, thank you. I'm unmuted. A uh, couple of things. Uh, 
first of all, to be fair to the US, um, we have many more women in the diplomatic service than we did 20 years ago. It has been uh, uh, you know, a straight line upwards in getting more women into the service, more women in senior positions, more women ambassadors. So progress has been made, not enough, but I wanted to record the progress. And we actually, with ambassadors, do better than the Europeans, I would note. So that's an important data point. Are women good diplomats? Yes, very much so. I think so. Um, women well, have, I think the question is, are they better diplomats than well, men? Well, they, they bring different attributes, often, particularly in the MENA region, more access. You have access not only to the corridors of power, if you're an ambassador or a representative of the United States, but also to, um, to families and homes and family dynamics, which are often extremely powerful and determinative, where men can't go. Um, I think women are very strong in the consensus building, in the listening. A lot of things which we have found absent, particularly since 9-11, where, <clears throat> where we've been in a far more um, uh, finger-wagging, lecturing mode um, in our diplomacy understandably, but that really needs to change. So I think, there, the, I think women are equally good diplomats, in some cases better, um, I, and um, that we need to in, uh, continue the trend of having more women in leadership positions uh, in diplomacy. Okay, um, Ambassador Patterson, um, how would you compare your experiences uh, working in the MENA region um, as against your work in other regions. Um, was it particularly or was there any issue in which you found it particularly uh, challenging as, you know, um, put on the ground to convince uh, Washington to adopt a particular uh, policy as against what, you know, um, it's tending to from Washington. In other words, how would you, as a whole, compare your experience uh, working as a female diplomat in the MENA region? So I, first, let me say I agree with Ambassador Rafael that women have made considerable progress in the American Foreign Service. Uh, certainly, I was in 43 years, and the changes are really quite dramatic over 43 years. But we have a huge advantage overseas. We had a huge advantage in the Middle East. I was in Saudi Arabia in the 80s as well. We, we represented the United States of America. So we had access, as, as Ambassador Rayfield said, to, to almost everybody in power. Uh, and I would also add that in the last 30 years in the Middle East, we've also seen dramatic improvements in women. Uh, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, uh, most Saudi women my age couldn't read because there had been no public education until 1963. The slaves hadn't been freed until the 60s. So there have been enormous social changes throughout the MENA region that have, that have certainly helped ease the job of women diplomats. They were unheard of 30 years ago in the Middle East in many countries. So that's changed and that's a good thing. So I think at senior levels, uh, American diplomats uh, generally didn't have a problem in either Latin America or in the Middle East or elsewhere that I had served. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Winstanley, you were the first female consul general in Saudi Arabia. Um, just to piggyback on what Ambassador Patterson has said, giving its history, right, of gendered constraints, if you will, um, and deep culture of patriarchy, not to say that patriarchy is not endemic in other places, but we know, you know, when we say this, like we are using relative terms. What was your experience working in the country? Um, what was, you know, how would you uh, characterize your experience working in the country? Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I want to go back to one thing that I believe either Ambassador Patterson or Ambassador Rafel mentioned about women in the U.S. diplomatic corps and about it being a straight line for us uh, increasing our numbers, and that is not true. 
Um, the GAO has put out a report in the last year. I urge everyone to have a look at it, particularly my, my former colleagues. Uh, and in fact, women and African Americans in the Department of State and the Foreign Service have declined. We have not gone up. So the study goes between 2002 and 2018. And so have a look at it. It's deeply disturbing and we have work to do, but I want to put that out there for you all. Uh, Saudi Arabia was, a, I, I often say, the best and worst three years of my life. Um, certainly as a woman, as a minority, I knew what I was going there to do, and it was broader as, as women when we go in places that are male-dominated. We know that we go with an extra burden or an extra responsibility, depending on how you want to look at it, and an extra opportunity. Um, I believe that women, your question earlier about whether we're better diplomats, I'm not going to say that we're better diplomats, but I am going to say I believe that we come with a wider arsenal of tools with which to be successful. We come with the same training and background in education as our male colleagues, but I think as women we also have the space to expand on that, to use non-traditional tools. You cannot have the same expectations that we're going to fit in a box as you would for our male colleagues. And that works even more, I believe, as a minority. So going into Saudi Arabia, I was often, often a surprise walking into rooms. People were not expecting a US diplomat to be female heading up the, the consulate, being that the chief of mission there. They were not expecting me to be female and they were not expecting me to be brown. So as that discussion, negotiation, introduction, meeting, I felt I had a little bit of an edge because they had to regroup from the surprise and then carry on. And I knew who I was going to be meeting when I walked into those rooms. I will say that every, mm, everyone was always extremely gracious and welcoming. Uh, good manners abound around the world. Um, but that I was able to, as Ambassador Rafael said, get in spaces where none of my predecessors were able to get. And as we talk about the corridors of power, as you know, in Arabic, they talk about women as, you know, was it al Dakhaliya, the Minister of Interior? So those corridors of power are not only in ministries, but they're also in homes. And I met some of the most incredible, capable, outstanding, focused people in the country, working for the betterment of the people in very informal, non-traditional ways. Because women, when we have to get something done, colleagues, you know, we find a way to do it. So it might not be directly through the minister of this, that, or the other. It might be through personal relationships or setting up a non-governmental organization to feed people, to educate people, to train people. And Saudi women were doing that, often with support from their male family members, often without that support, but still trying to get it done. Their effort these days of trying to move from oil-based to knowledge-based by using all of their population, not just the 50% that is male or the 49% that is male, is what is going to, in my view, save and move forward that nation as any nation. Nobody can succeed using half of their population. Okay. So it was a great experience. There were certainly challenges, uh, which we can talk about if people are interested in hearing about some of those. Right. Well, but I felt I went with additional advantages as a woman and as a brown woman. Okay, thank you. Great. And, and so let's put up the third poll, uh, audience poll, uh, before we move on. Uh, please take a moment and uh, respond to that. And then we will take um, some audience questions. And um, move on. Perhaps uh, we will have Ambassador Rafael and Ambassador Jones, um, you know, tackle this briefly and then we'll move to another one. What advice or suggestions would you give to young women who want to start a career in diplomacy? Uh, let's start with Ambassador Rafael. I would say, go for it. 
absolutely. <laughs> there are challenges, uh, as many of us have named. Uh, but I think it is a, a, a very interesting, fascinating career uh, and that there are more and more opportunities to meld family life with uh, this career. Uh, that's been a challenge in the past, but again, it's getting, it's getting easier. And I think uh, while there's, there's more opportunity for voice generally, uh, in the last couple of years, this has been an anomalous time, I think, for women and foreign service officers altogether. But for a young person to join, I would say now is the time. Very interesting challenges ahead for diplomats. Thank you. Ambassador Jones? I would, I would strongly echo what uh, Ambassador Rafel has said. I would, um, first of all, it's the best work in the world. I think I can't, I spent 34 years in this business. I don't think there was a morning I woke up saying that I wasn't interested in the work I was doing or not interested in going to work, even when it was on the visa line because it is the perfect job for the intellectually ADHD. I mean, you're learning something new every day. You're learning about people, you're learning about topics, you're learning about power relationships, you're learning about how to present yourself and how to manage others. It's really a, a great, um, combination of challenges and plus you get to you know you're representing your country and and doing something that is worthwhile um i do think that it is challenging if you choose to have a family as well as i think all of us uh, you know have a, we all have families of, of some sort but um but i think that it's it's well worth uh, well worth doing and i have to tell you you know G, uh, i know that ambassador uh, win stanley she's focused a lot more on the statistics and like you know, and on certain groups, and I, I can't disagree with that because I don't have the same background. But I will tell you that having moved back and forth, as many of us have now, between the corporate world or between private, so-called private sector and government, um, I have to say that I found the environment in which I worked with my colleagues was always one of respect, um, was one, you know, by and large within the department, um, where at least people knew how they were the rules expected them to behave a certain way, and there were means for dealing with that. And I was frankly surprised when I came out to see how absolutely non-diverse some of our private sector areas were uh, by comparison to the government, and particularly, you know, the U.S. military is very diverse by comparison, reflects uh, inter uh, national um, statistics in terms of, of gender and race, not gender so much, but certainly ethnic groups, if you go and actually look at the statistics and not what people think they are. Um, and so I think it's a great opportunity. And I think that it, it is a very, there have been moments, there were moments, that, you know, I won't say there was never a moment I wanted to quit and say, you know, to hell with all of you. Um, but at, at the end of the day, no, it was just a great, I, best work in the world, I always tell people. Okay, well, uh, there you have it. Um, and so let's kind of uh, move gears a little bit. There's no doubt that the events uh, of the past week in the United States uh, has been widely reported across, across the world. Uh, we've had people, you know, from across the world writing us letters of all manners of letters and, and all that. Um, part of America's influence in in the MENA region as is across the world is its soft power, right? Uh, which has been, you know, its ideals, right? Ideals of democracy and uh, individual equality and, and, and all that. Um, given, the, given the ongoing issue, uh, do you perceive um, a hypocrisy uh, in what we profess as our ideals and what we actually practice. And does this have implications, right? Does this have adverse implications for um, America's engagement in the region as well as across, right? So uh, are we preaching um, a different, uh, a different, um, ideal? Are we preaching a different gospel and engaging differently? Uh, so perhaps let's start with uh, Kristen. 
no. Um, to be honest, I think that the fact that America is airing its dirty laundry for the world to see is the best example we can be. I think that um, watching us go through this kind of pain is really valuable for, for people in other countries. And um, my concern is that the lesson it might teach senior decision makers in other countries is that you can't allow for this kind of vocalization of, uh, of true, true emotion or dissent. And that worries me about what they may be planning in their own capitals um, to make sure they don't have to deal with this. But this is the strength of America. And um, I do hope that it, it, it gives some, uh, some voice to others in, in countries where they may feel like they haven't uh, felt like they could really speak up watching this and watching you know, pushback on, on a, a country. And America is, uh, is tough, right? And so seeing, seeing the country kind of come together, seeing the, uh, the kind of unity of voice and seeing the freedom of expression that we have here that just is unprecedented in other places, I don't care how, how messy it looks. I think it's really valuable for the world to watch us, uh, watch us suffer and, and, and watch how we come through it. Um, Ambassador Jones? You'd hear, you're watching my face. I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one, I, I, what has been interesting in the COVID crisis and dealing with that and also now dealing, <clears throat> but, but it has implications beyond that because of what we're seeing racially too. If you look around the world, the countries that have dealt best with COVID are not the countries with strength and power measured by traditional means. GDP, which is a false, by the way, it's become a pretty false measure if you ask me. Um, and it was invented, I think in the 1930s actually, because it suited our purposes. But by, if, you, if you measure by GDP and by military might or those other kinds of strength, um, then China and the U.S. should have been the best position to deal with this. But in fact, we've seen that that's not the case. So what, what we have seen and what some have suggested is that what we've seen is the countries where they have the strongest social compact and the strongest sense of legitimacy or the feeling, such as Germany or New Zealand or other places where, they, where members of society feel invested in their government and feel that their government is invested in them, that those in fact are the places that have dealt best with COVID. We have a deep stain in this country. We have several deep stains. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We have uh, indigenous peoples here who have been here far longer than any people who look like me, even though my Mormon ancestors came here in the 1850s. That's nothing, that's a spit in the bucket compared to how long these people have been here. And our, we have not dealt with our um, westward movement or with our economic expansion that was based on the backs of either slaves or indigenous peoples or brown peoples or whatever you wanna call it. And we have to deal with that. And I hope, you know, we all pray that Martin Luther King was right. Dr. Martin Luther King, when he said the arc of justice is long, but it trends in this direction. Gosh, doggone it, it's been 60 or 70, you know, more than 60 years since he said that. Let's get on it, folks. That's one, you know, that's a long time in our history. And I think we're going to get on it. And I agree with uh, Kirsten that, you know, we will embrace this moment and we'll take the energy and we'll go from there. There's a change. This is different this time. And people have to face the fundamental question, which is, uh, is this a white nation or is this a nation of immigrants? And that we're not Europe, we're not Africa, a nation of black, you know, we, we are an ethnically, there. I mean, even beyond, we are a racially mixed nation of immigrants and we have to deal with what our founding principles are and the, our, what we call our center of gravity as a nation, if it's gonna keep us grounded and powerful. And that's the lesson, and, but it's a lesson for everyone else and people watch and some people try to exploit. And I'm here to tell you, we're gonna pull through this. You know, I know that. I have daughters in their 20s. I know damn well how they feel about all of this. And we're gonna pull through this and you're gonna see us come out better at the end. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ambassador Winston Lee, are you as optimistic? Well, let me do something that my media training tells me not to do, which is actually answer the question you asked. Mm -hmm. um, and your question initially was, has America been hypocritical? 
with preaching abroad certain values and ideals while not practicing them largely at home. And it made me smile when you ask it. And I will say, as parents are hypocritical, yes, we are. Insofar as you know what the right thing is to do. You say, do it. You don't always do it. So that's the answer to your initial question. Am I as hopeful as Ambassador Jones? I, we have a mutual friend who has told us repeatedly that we have been here before, that people marched in the streets before. You know, we, we've all noticed that those who are speaking out against uh, oppression, discrimination, etc., racism in the United States has been very diverse crowds. And that's noteworthy and comforting, I will say, as a woman of color, as a black woman. Um, but as I said, we have this friend who says we've been here before. In the end, nothing is going to change. I tend to, to agree with Ambassador Jones. I think we are at a different inflection point. Um, that there is, with the blessing of video camera, what the African-American community in this country has known, now nobody can pretend otherwise. You can't hide because we've all seen it. But we saw this with someone else a few years ago with Eric Gardner, which we thought would be, my goodness, it was on camera. How can anybody gainsay that? And yet, there wasn't a great change at that time. So while I tend to be more hopeful at this time, I certainly do not shirk from the knowledge that there is a great deal of work to be done, that it will not be easy, that we, we in the civil rights movement, you know that they, Rosa Parks was not the first person not to give up her seat on the bus, but that the NAACP decided that the first person who stood her ground was not the appropriate symbol for the movement. Rosa Parks was the appropriate, respectable, had a nice look symbol for the movement. And there have been those who argue that Mr. Floyd is not the right symbol, but he should be the last person to die in that way in this country. We all can do better and it will strengthen our message abroad. Again, we've been here before in the 50s and 60s, Carl Rowan, our, our jazz ambassadors, we tried to, to give the message overseas that we were working toward improving uh, the situation of African Americans in the country. So here we are again, but I tend to agree with Ambassador Jones. Okay, um, thank you. So uh, let's uh, move on, uh, Ambassador, Raphael and Ambassador Patterson, hindsight is 2020. If you had the privilege of hindsight, what would you do differently? Uh, let's start with Ambassador Patterson. What would I do differently in my career? Right, in as a diplomat in the MENA region. I, I think there's, there's, I think fundamentally these are relationship-based societies. Uh, I would spend more time on language. I would spend more time on learning about the country and I would spend more time on developing relationships within the country because that's really our comparative advantage in the foreign service is to know what's going on in foreign countries. So I would, I, and I was struck with this uh, when I spent time at Yale. I had an opportunity to, to delve into the history and, and of the region that I hadn't had before and it was hugely important. So I think all foreign service officers should spend more time uh, on the specifics of the region and, and uh, develop, prepare to develop relationships. Thank you. Ambassador Raphael? I agree with Ambassador Patterson. Um, I think that the U.S. Foreign Service uh, could could take the example of other diplomatic services, which provide much more time and in-depth training for their diplomats, whether it's language, culture, history, and so on. Uh, a two-year preparatory course before you go into the diplomatic corps, as opposed to the six weeks that we have at the beginning, uh, could, really be, could really be helpful. 
Um, I think we, we recognize uh, that we're sometimes disadvantaged uh, by some of our, our um, competitors, shall I say, who are deeply steeped in language and culture and, and spend their careers in, in a region and don't uh, move in and out so quickly as we do, um, that that would, would improve our uh, basis uh, for understanding relationship building and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take a couple more audience questions. What future do you predict for monarchies such as the Al Nayan and Al Saud families, Al Saudi families in UAE and Saudi, who were able to assert control over their kingdoms despite the Arab Spring, primarily by providing citizens innumerable financial benefits? Um, let's start with Kirsten and then Ambassador Winstanley. I think the, the ability of these monarchies across the region and elsewhere in the world are, are, are going to be um, taxed in terms of their, how much they can provide in terms of a large debt to their populations post COVID, oil price war, um, energy transition, the whole nine yards. And it's going to, I think their ability to survive will be based on how convincing they are to their population that that largesse, that these, all these subsidies and the like are not uh, an entitlement that that was a time and place when they were able to do that because of world economies and that that doesn't last forever. If they are unable to convince their populations that there will need to be fiscal measures put in place to ensure the survivability of the country, then they will, they will face opposition because we know that, that other political opposition groups, extremist groups and, and other sorts of opposition will use that as a message. They are no longer looking out for you. They are taking this money and putting it into yachts. So I think we'll need to see the monarchies uh, show a little self-restraint in their personal spending, and we'll need to see them a lot more convincing to their populations about these fiscal measures. Frankly, the world can be helpful with that. We can show examples of how fiscal measures were put in place in other countries in the region and beyond, look at Egypt, look at Jordan, um, and, and how populations had to kind of tighten the belt a bit. But they're, 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 it's, I think with new youthful leadership right now that we're seeing across the region, we haven't seen this kind of political change in 50 years in the region because of the monarchical transitions. And speaking of inflection points, this is another one. Thank you. Ambassador um, Winstanley? Um, unmute yourself, please. Sorry about that. Um, I agree uh, with much of Kirsten said about the largesse, but I also think maybe um, an equally valid term would be in investment uh, and mutual. And that goes back to what Ambassador Jones said with regard to countries able to handle crises are those where the government is clearly invested in the population and the population clearly believes that about the government. And so it's that mutuality. Um, I think that if the royal family, certainly in Saudi Arabia, can continue to make that point above all the rest of it, that they will stay firmly uh, in control. Um, keeping in mind that as they saw the Arab Spring and all the results of it, that the countries where that stability was in place, it, people were looking around saying that we don't want that. We don't want that. We, we would like more particip political participation, but we don't want it that way. We don't want to go through that. So I think that mutuality, that investment is what's going to keep them in power. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think perhaps it's just, it's a, a discussion for another day, right, to kind of examine um, although, of course, you know, as Ambassador Jones has said, the social contract, the mutuality, right, between the government and the people does exist. But to how, you know, what extent, right, does time and, um, you know, progression of ideologies within society affect or change that, right? Um, of course, you know, this is not to... Uh, this is not to go back to the uh, end of history um, theory, you know, about uh, democracy and uh, liberal democracies and all that, right? But perhaps 
to what extent would one um, expect that despite you know, a mutuality of government provision that at the point, you know, the, the citizens might start actually asking for more, right, above what the question has, the, the, the individual that asked the question has said, above, you know, the provision of, you know, uh, basic amenities and, and provision of, you know, uh, infrastructure and all that. Will the Saudis and the rest of the royal monarchies come to a point where they have to, in fact, contend with their own Arab Springs, Arab uprising. Um, Ambassador Jones? I, you know, during the Arab uprisings, the, the 2011 spring, I think one of, one of my, one of the individuals who I think uh, best captured the difference between what was happening in the republics and in the monarchies or in the ruling, the, the hereditary ruling countries, hereditarily ruled countries was Rami Khouri, who talked about three elements. And I think Ambassador Wynne Stanley talked about some of those as well. It was legitimacy, humiliation, you know, and, and yeah, there were these, these were very two important things. And they said where you did not have a legit, an accepted legitimacy of ruler. In other words, where you had a republic where the rulers were hanging on forever without ever naming a replacement and the republic didn't accept that, there was a problem. There was always the, the issue of humiliation, that populations were suppressed. Um, I think, you know, and in all of those cases, that's exactly the places where people were overthrown. In the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they had the, the, a sense of legitimacy about the ruler, the same whether in the UAE, in Kuwait, and other places, as well as, I think we tend to look at the, um, you know, the wealth factor, and that's a part of it, but that's not all of it. You know, I think we need to remember that Thomas Jefferson talked about the tribe as actually being a quite good system of governance if you're small enough to make it work because the leaders share the afflictions of the tribe and share the benefits of the tribe. So they have an understanding that, that uh, is possible in that smaller setting that you don't have in larger settings. I think what we are going to see in the United States, and we're already seeing it in the, in the reaction to COVID, for example, and I think we will also see it as we deal with the racial uh, uh, issues and the conflict that we're seeing right now, that we need to shift gears from a, the, the white leader or the, the heroic male leader, and this gets back to our whole theme, to more communal, uh, to more local kinds of government, to where you have more empowerment, because let's face it, Social media has completely thrown off kilter the physics of the nation state as described by Max Weber. You know, uh, since you're at SAIS, we can use these terms and we can talk about this, that, that in fact, that one of the, what, there were two critical components in Weber's political science that were for the, for the creation of the modern nation state. One was, of course, the charismatic leader, and the second was the uh, domination by the state, a monopoly on the use of violence or power. But as we all know in physics, force or power equals mass times acceleration. This has changed everything. You cannot tell me who led the, up to the overthrow of Mubarak in, in Egypt or who, over, who led the revolution in, in uh, Libya or who led uh, the issues in, you know, in Syria or in, in Yemen or anything else. It's proven very effective at destroying and pulling down because force equals mass times acceleration, the electron accelerant in the hands of the people of the masses equals an incredible force. And governments everywhere are struggling to deal with that because our whole architecture of governance has been hierarchy. It looks like the church or Roman buildings and that's changing. And, and, and we're learning that during the COVID thing as we're talking to people from all over and conferencing as you know, across vast territories without having to go to the ruler or what have you and empowering people. And I think that that's what we have to see in order for governments to be, remain legitimate is this can, is an increasingly uh, community based and, uh, you know, yes, yeah, some things are always going to be in the hands of, you know, I mean, national military, national security, those kinds of big issues. But I think we're going to see much more of a collectively uh, collaborative female, if you would like to say, based where we're listening 
we're taking in solutions and then somebody yes you have to have a decision making authority or process you know it can't be so messy but it's got to be more collaborative and it can't be so top down and i think we're going to see the clash between those two things right now as we go into our next elections here thank you um should the u.s refocus their energy time and money in the mena region towards development projects rather than conflict conflict management um ambassador rafael i have unmuted there look i think um that in the post-covid um uh order which i think is is going to be uh, a, an, an order that replaces the already crumbling liberal world order of post-World War II, which we helped create, uh, that there will need to be more focus on collaboration. There will have to be more focus on inclusion, um, bringing people in uh, to, uh, to help us and those who have more resources decide how they would best be spent. Uh, that's a bit wordy, but I would say absolutely, yes, we should spend more time on social and economic issues, but there's an important caveat, and that is we need to listen more uh, and take into account much more the voice and needs of the people in the region, what they want, what they would like help with, rather than our, our own prescriptions, which we've used for years. All right, thank you. Um, will the ambassadors kindly and candidly explain the challenges they have faced as women representatives in the MENA region, specifically in the case of Saudi Arabia? How do they see the tension between US interests and the crackdown on women democratic leaders? Um, Kirsten? I thought you might turn to Gina first and she, she lived there, Kirsten. Uh, you know, that's kind of a, a personal question and then a, a larger question. The U.S. continually engages with Saudi Arabia and other countries on human rights issues. It's not always sexy enough to the front page, but anytime there are talking points prepared for any senior leader, that's always on the table. We never aren't beating that. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's, it's not going to be in the readout every time, but just I want America to know and, and our partners around the world to know that that's something that is constantly brought up. Uh, in terms of personal, personally dealing with um, being a female in, in a, you know, in a White House role, engaging with Saudi Arabia, I didn't have a problem. And I think as as other as uh, Ambassador Jones and as Ambassador Rafael have talked about, women from Western countries who are in senior official positions are treated as a third gender, and it's to our benefit. Um, we have access to both the personal lives and to the official lives, and um, we're we're kind of given this uh, this authority. Um, but also this, this include, you know, we're welcomed in, in a way that our male counterparts are not. I think there's also greater trust in us. If they feel like we know what they, we are talking about, I believe that they trust us more than they trust some of our male counterparts. To be honest, from a completely personal level, I've had more trouble with Americans in unaccompanied positions in the MENA region than I have had with my Arab counterparts in the MENA region. Interesting. <laughs> that, uh, Ambassador Winston Lee? Briefly? Uh, yes, to everything that Ms. Fontenrose said. Um, when you asked the question, I, the first thing I went back to was your question about hypocrisy. And I am reminded even while Kirsten was in a senior role at the National Security Council, uh, when there was a meeting with the Saudi entourage in the White House and a photograph came out of it, and in that photograph was nothing but men sitting on both sides of the table. So for uh, the United States at this point to be pointing too many fingers, even so, obviously everyone has challenges still. Kristen knows how I felt about that photograph because I think I sent a screaming email to her immediately as to what in the world is going on. Um, I definitely had challenges in Saudi, but I want to talk about a couple of the positive ones. The year before I got there, the Jeddah Economic Forum had been held, and I believe that they had the women in a separate room. 
um, for the forum. The year that I got there, they decided to allow the women in the same room, but they were behind a large barrier that was probably 20 feet high that divided. And so the women were squeezed in this little corner and then the men were lounging comfortably through you know, seven eighths of the room while they listened to the speakers on the stage. And as I was coming into the forum, as, as my colleagues have said, you're that third gender, um, I did not choose to use women's entrances ever. And I was coming into the front part of the, uh, I was at a hotel probably or a conference center and the guards stopped me at the door. And I said, I was the Consul General of the United States of America. And they said, mm -hmm, the women's entrance is that way. They were not interested at all. And a uh, uh, Saudi businessman that I had gotten to know came up and linked arms with mine. And he said, she's the consul general. And we walked through the front door. Now I might've been able to get there myself, but it was going to take a bit more effort and uh, to do, and we probably would have had cameras there um, if I had stood my ground as I intended to do. But with that Saudi, so graciously seeing what the situation was, helping ease that situation in the very next year they took away the border the barrier altogether so the women didn't have to squeeze into one small corner so those sorts of things i think happened easily for me because i was a western woman but they also happened for saudi women were were saudi men and women understand the value that women bring and try to do their best the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. Consulate was able to help with bringing Saudi men and women together at times when they could not meet otherwise. And I'll, I'll stop there, but I did want to tell that story as well. Thank you. Um, let's see if we can get through a couple more questions. Um, we are fast coming up on time. Um, how is the U.S. support of Israel's annexation of West Bank lands going to affect the situation in the Middle East? Um, I'll leave this open. Um, I don't know if whoever um, wants to take this. Please go ahead. Yes, and, and, and Ambassador Patterson. Uh, I think, and some of my colleagues may disagree with this, but I think the Palestinian issue has receded uh, con very considerably in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, I don't think particularly younger Arabs are paying much attention to it. The question for me isn't what it's going to do in the MENA region, it's what it's going to do to Israel. And, and my former boss, uh, Secretary Kerry, spoke a lot about that. They're going to have enormous challenges on, um, on incorporating these populations into their country in a way that's fair and equitable, and it's going to raise many questions, I think, about America's relationship uh, with, uh, with Israel. The one that most immediately affected, of course, will be Jordan. The king has spoken out on this many times, uh, that, it will, that it will undermine his position. So I think, uh, I hope the Israeli government is reflecting on this uh, um, at great length. Thank you. Um, Somebody is asking about the strategies to strengthen U.S. and EU cooperation uh, in the MENA region. Ambassador Rafael and then Ambassador Jones, and then we will wrap up. Well, I would just say um, at present, I don't think we're working as closely with our allies as we have in the past. Um, but that uh, I expect um, when there's a fresh administration of whatever party that we will be revisiting that. Um, and, you know, I think for the future, we really need more rather than less collaboration and cooperation. Ambassador Jones. You know, I'm going to pop, pop this one to Kirsten Fontenrose because I think she is much more uh, connected with the current administration than I am in terms of being able to talk uh, to its uh, contacts with the EU and others, if you don't mind. That's excellent. We're out. Kirsten? I hate to admit this, but I've, I've told several European colleagues when I was asked, hey, when you were at the NSC, how often did Europe's thinking take, um, or, you know, play a role in your, in your policy making? And the answer was never. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that my my lens has changed being at the Atlantic Council now, I think of Europe constantly and the transatlantic relationship and the importance of 
our partners beyond just the Middle East, but I, you know, was so focused on Middle East. Uh, but I, I, we're doing quite a bit. I mean, you know, we're, we're in places like Iraq where we're talking about U.S. transition and the, and the increased role of NATO there, for instance. But what we continue to hear from our European partners is we can't replace you. So we, we'd like you to be a little more civil sometimes, America, but, um, but we can't replace you. So we're, we're really not looking for you to take a back seat. We're not looking necessarily to take the lead. And even the head of the EU, the, the new head, has said things like, we've got to be more aggressive. You know, we need a more forceful EU. And I think even the administration agrees with that. We would like to see the EU more vocal, more out in front. Um, you know, America can't always be in the forefront. Look what happens when we are. We don't always get things right. So uh, the administration is, is pro a more active EU. Of course, that means we'd like the EU to be on our side of issues. But uh, I think any country would agree with that. Thank you. With and then, uh, to be on their side. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, please, uh, so let's uh, launch the final question, uh, audience poll question. And uh, as we do that, um, I think we'll just go ahead and wrap up here. And uh, since we did not get the opportunity or to take the opening remarks from the panelists, um, let's go for the closing remarks. And let's start with Ambassador Patterson. I just wanted to say a couple things about U.S. policy. We haven't spoken much about uh, the, we've spoken about the economic side of it. I do think the U.S. needs to uh, invest more in health and education in the region. And I think we need to consider bilateral trade agreements. I know trade isn't very popular right now, but these could be targeted at specific countries like Egypt, uh, where they might be very effective. And I think the other thing the U.S. needs to do is revise our military assistance programs because these countries are going to be forced to defend themselves more aggressively as the U.S. is increasingly pulled into Egypt, I, uh, pulled into Asia. I think what we've seen in recent years is many of these Middle Eastern uh, uh, militaries frankly aren't very effective militarily. Uh, and they've got to get their act together uh, before we uh, withdraw from the region. Thank you. Um, that was a fast one. Okay, uh, let's move on to Ambassador um, Jones. Faster to touch with thing. You know, I agree um, with many things. I think that what we have seen is that it is important for the U.S. to have a voice uh, to be seen with an opinion. Um, obviously, we have a lot of work to do at home, but I think that we all hope to see a a foreign policy and an, an engagement that is more collaborative, that is more. Um, as Robin Rafel said, in a listening mode sometimes, um, but that we are very, we remain very clear uh, about what our aspirations are in terms of our better angels, and and as even as we struggle with a lot of things at home, and I, I think that this has been a humbling experience for us, but maybe a necessary one, but it, a corrective one, and I. Um, would hope that we would dedicate more resources to, again, governance and economic growth and uh, things that will uh, have longer lasting uh, solutions. We've got to get away from the kinetic approach, which is uh, very satisfying in the short term, but not it, it doesn't return a lot in the long term. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Winstanley? Uh, I I want to close on a comment for all the women out there who are participating in this discussion, wherever you are, whatever country you are phoning in from, Zooming in from. We need your voice. We need your participation. No country can get their national security right if all of us are not at the table, our perspectives, our backgrounds, our experiences brought to bear. The broader the array of people around the table, the more options that can lead to successful solutions will be put on that table. You are needed. And I urge you to pursue careers in foreign policy in general, but certainly in the diplomatic core, because the primacy should be on diplomacy, not on military, Kirsten. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you.
<laughs> thank you very much. Ambassador Raphael? Yes, thank um, you. I certainly agree with Ambassador Wynne Stanley on the point about women's participation. And, and I would add, you know, that we sometimes think um, our, our friends and enemies alike are enjoying our current struggle because they have seen us, particularly in the last 20 years or so, be very hypocritical and, and deaf to their voices. But I think the truth is that nobody wants to see America fail. It's been a predictable value-based voice, not always perfect, uh, but standing for the rule of law, standing for justice as values. So I think the trick is, and here I'm reiterating what we were doing before, what I said before, is we need to concentrate on a new collaborative and inclusive world order. Okay, thank you. And um, very quickly, uh, Kristen. Sure, I'll, I'll mirror what, what Gina said and, and just kind of speak to the young women who might be watching and just say, you know, it, it is incredibly important that you get involved. And just remember that when you are the one woman in a room in a male dominated industry, whether it's government or private sector, you will be remembered in that room and you wanna be remembered for the right reasons. So I don't care how scandalous this sounds, do not use your feminine wiles, ladies, that will not get you where you need to be. Um, please always be the smartest person in the room because you often are, even if you second guess yourself, do not be afraid to speak up. Please start talking, please start taking uh, more responsibility, take advanced roles, don't, don't question whether or not you're qualified, you are, and uh, get in here with us. Okay, Hafid, please, and uh, then we close. Well, um, I want to thank everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I'm just choking. Thank you all very, very much. I think everybody <clears throat> now, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think uh, um, the, 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 this panel has answered the, the question about whether women are much more capable uh, uh, to be diplomats. I think everybody can see very clearly why that is so. Um, I want to thank everybody, both, of course, our distinguished panelists, each one of them, and uh, the audience uh, that joined us. Uh, and now I think all of you can see why I am always uh, reaching out to some of these ladies. The first I get challenged by something of substance, um, I reach out to them uh, privately as friends and as colleagues. I am very proud to have most of them as my personal friends. So thank you very, very much, all of you. I am extremely grateful. And thank you so very much, uh, my dear uh, Chido. Uh, you've done an excellent job in doing this. I hope you have all a, a great day and stay safe.